I don't <laughs> want to talk about it. <laughs> okay. I'm still I'm doing uh, the master course in uh, uh, arts and music management. Uh, my research is going to be about uh, the film industry and how new technology has an impact on that and it changes the way films are promoted and how the audience is part of all this process. Did everybody hear that? Good. Uh, I'm Clovis, doing my art practice uh, full time. Uh, still the same here for a holiday for a break. <laughs> and basically, right now, you know, I mean, you know, right now, you know, my research actually, I'm looking into imitation. How am I going to move away from imitation? Interesting. Of you know, identity of you know, social structure of. I'm trying to look into this thing. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm doing the full time fine art. Um, I'm interested in Grey's Anatomy, queer, gender, and identity. Can you come up with interesting forms of genitalia? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, as, just to throw that out. Yeah, just be making some fat sculptures. <laughs> okay. We'll get into this later. Uh, my name's Andre. I'm just setting in today because I'm going to apply to the Media Arts Philosophy um, for September. Um, like Kate, I'm interested in in between us as well, liminality, the Thoreas, ambiguities, paradox. You're doing some weird wall right now, aren't you? I'm, I was casting while well, moulding one of the library walls. Um, as you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, yeah. I'm helping an artist. I'm, I'm gonna, on a project with the Library of Birmingham for the move from the John Maiden building to the, the new gold box. Um, so um, it's, it's one of the projects I'm working so on. So they call it, they call it a gold box. No, it's just me being facetious. Oh, I call it the hairnet, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank um, you. I'm Grace, I'm first year practicing a PhD and looking at the mediumistic um, female body and um, within the supernatural. Um, I've got also issues around doubt and, and how we kind of, um, well, how we come to doubt and how we have certain belief systems. Excellent. I'm Anna, I'm sitting in. And you're a, uh, um, uh, in, in this room or in general? Okay, already a philosopher. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and uh, my practice is generally sculptural, video, sound, installation based. Um, and I'm interested in stuff and building affects that effect. Great. Kate, you want to do it again? The, now the camera's rolling. Okay, I'm Kate. <laughs> um, my specialism is drama, and I teach at Newman University College. And, um, uh, I'm here because it's lovely to be amongst people doing research in the arts because we don't really have much of that at all at my institution where I work. Um, and I'm interested in intermediality, <coughs> states between us, and my PhD was on Edward Bond and Jacques Lacan. <laughs> Very good. Hi, I'm Jude. I'm first year part-time and in student in Queer Studies, Arts and Culture. Um, the background is production design for film and set design for theatre. I've worked mainly in my, art, my own art practice for some installations. Um, I do love work with charities. I like to play with space and causing effects on people and creating ambiguities for mm -hmm. And do you think there's a difference between ambiguity and in-betweenness? Um, it depends whether you're the audience or you actually perform it. Okay, interesting response. Good. I'm Greg, I'm on the <coughs> MA Fine Arts part-time, year two. Um, I'm interested in um, the physical relationship between us and the landscape, uh, geo-emotionality, and the notion of extent. And you just came from somewhere. No, I have just come from Japan, but people know that. I did a residency <laughs> well, at uh, four, four other residents there. Uh, two other um, artists uh, learning how to make paper. It's, it's very interesting how to make paper. It's had an effect. It's had an effect has on it? my work. Yeah, it has. It's had an effect on my... my Why? Texture? My, uh, state of mind and just, and just my relationship with material, actually. Huh. Uh, membranes, skin. Hmm. Yeah. Permeable surfaces. Yeah, great. Uh, Francesco, Master of Fine Art, I'm a painter, and my background was philosophy, and now I'm changing somewhere else, maybe. And for me, I understand where I'm going. And what color do you like the best? Black. Yeah. 
why did I know that? <laughs> okay, okay. So you have something in common there. Okay. Um, Stuart, fine art, MA, part time, first year. Um, interest in landscape, place, places, process. Mm -hmm. There's something else about your work that's very um, ephemeral. Um, maybe we shouldn't bring it. I'll bring it up later with you. Okay. Okay. I'm Anna Lorenz. I'm on the full-time fine art course, and my background is um, silversmithing and jewelry, which is very object and obviously outcome driven. And I tr in this course, I try to si see how I can situate my practice more in the fine art area. So I'm exploring space and. Um, quality of space, opening up of surfaces to create depths within them. And shadow, you do shadow work. Yes. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Sarah, I'm <coughs> on a part-time MA fine art course, and I'm working a lot of drawing at the moment, and how to be very intense in black space. <laughs> <This is true. laughs> Which is a lie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Um, Dan Warrello, MAFA PT2. <laughs> <laughs> um, my research practically based, is based in cognition and science of senses, and my, re my methodology is based in looking at film, um, looking at digital environments such as semantic webs, online technology, and how something like a virus sort of spreads and goes across those different levels. And I don't paint. And you don't paint? Is there any black in your work? Um, it's usually on a black background. Mm -hmm. Stuff sort of <laughs> yes. right stuff from there. Okay, we'll go back to that. Okay. Hi, John. I teach art design, and we rarely use black. <laughs> <laughs> but, what, um, what year are the teach? Uh, the the uh, secondary, <laughs> high school, um, and I'm on the art practice and education course, part time, <laughs> two years, and I'm interested in. Um, working with paint on cinefilm and, um, and what image it is um, and how that um, can be mediated through digital media. Great, excellent. And Jakob, I think you were the last one that wasn't on the thing. Can you? Uh, my name is Jakob. I'm doing uh, <laughs> a full time uh, master's in fine art. Uh, I'm interested mostly in uh, exploration of the self within the fine art and using that uh, as inspiration, let's say. Um, I work with uh, photography, text, uh, and recently video work, usually very short, but I'm looking around that. And you did a lot of work with irony and uh, yes. like jokes, actually, the sexual jokes. Yes, there was something about that. Genitalia, though. No. Genitalia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there is certain sexuality, and maybe ironic, ironical sexuality to my work, but yeah. I'm not sure where is that yet exactly. Mm -hmm. so. it's, a, it's a powerful aspect. Has everybody got a sense of who we are? Excellent. Okay. okay. Um, what I want to do today, so thank you for coming on this odd moment, uh, this kind of blip on the screen, but tomorrow we're going to go to Stan's Cafe. and. Um, I can't bear the idea of you not having a lesson every week. <laughs> so I'm glad that you were, thank you for arranging childcare and whatever else you have to do with yourselves. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> and Matthias sends his greetings. He uh, absolutely adored you all, which is not surprising, and uh, had a great time. So there you go. I don't know what you did, but anyway, um, <laughs> tried to convince him. <laughs> okay, what I want you to do today, just to make sure that you get what needs to be had before we launch heavily into the course. Uh, we're, today we're going back over the rhizome. I'm hoping people have this. Did you read it? Good. Um, I was trying to put it up on the screen, but for some reason I don't have privileges to download Adobe on there. So anyway, I couldn't get it up on the screen. So <clears throat> here's what I want to uh, explain about this course and about what, what this moment is that you're entering. You're entering it very specifically, and you need to prepare yourself for it. The debates that we had last semester were all around this question of dialectics and the, uh, and the way in which that logic was able to talk about art, 
and politics because it presented a totalizing view. What I mean by that is that it suggested, and it continues to suggest, that the best way to understand something is to be able to make sure that it's true in all cases. So it's true in the fourth century, it's true now, this is what would be objective, this means there's one kind of way of making it an analysis, otherwise it falls into an opinion. And there's all debates around that, you know, whether or not, you know, what is taste, is it, you know, in the eye of the beholder, how do you know when you're in front of good art, you know, whatever, all these kind of things, they're mediated or they're, um, they're sort of seen through this lens of dialectics. So you've got drenched into dialectics, and then, of course, the way Adorno um, ended up on the upbeat, um, you know, Auschwitz uh, thing, and the, uh, and a lot of you wrote on that and did a brilliant job um, on, on the question of Auschwitz and how that fit in to understanding this role of um, how the system as a totality doesn't just create a genocidal racism, but it requires it. And that was, you know, we, we got into how he could make that kind of claim and not just be an opinion and so on and so forth. So that's what was the basis of that. Now, this course, as you know, is called Untimely Meditations, and that means that we're gonna we're gonna play rough with time and space, surface and dialectics and so on. And the, the first, let's say, um, game, the ball game that gets thrown into the court is by, uh, well, we looked at fluxes and we looked at, you know, just to warm you up, we looked at some of these other things that were going on. What is a happening? What is an event? That is all just, you know, baby stuff. Now we're starting on the more tough stuff. This is not to say that fluxus is, you know, juvenile. It's just to say that we didn't look at it in the level we need to see it now. So I asked you to read uh, this work on the rhizome. And it's part of a larger work called the Thousand Plateaus by Deleuze and Guattari. And that's part of a larger work, uh, which is on capitalism and schizophrenia. I have a certain um, viral or you know, allergic reaction to when people use um, word, psychological words, psychological uh, things for explaining philosophy. However, I'm allowing this just for the moment because the whole book, oh, both, both volumes, um, Thousand Plateaus and, um, and the other one, uh, which is out of my mind at the moment. anti of course, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, they are um, pretty spectacular. I found uh, anti Oedipus a bit more tedious than A Thousand Plateaus because he speaks, both of them speak in this, you know, the machine is, you know, climbing around and just think, okay, if you're not into metaphor, why do you keep using them? Okay, so that was my, you know, irritation for years reading that book. Um, I'm now slowly getting back to it, but that's via um, A Thousand Plateaus. So what, do, what I want to share with you today is what was at stake and where we're going with it. Now I know that Mattia did a brilliant job literally setting out, or what he should have done a brilliant job on, was literally setting out what the rhizome is. So I know that you probably know that there are six aspects to it, right? You got all that. Did he actually say there are six parts of the rhizome? Anybody remember this lecture last week? <laughs> Did he say? He didn't rephrase it, six aspects. Oh, that's hilarious, no. okay. So about four, I think. Four, there are actually six, okay. And it's an even number, so it annoys me as well, but all right. Um, the rhizome, what a rhizome is, is literally taken from gardening. Uh, I'm not a gardener, so it was uh, difficult for me to use this, uh, but it's like, a uh, blade of grass doesn't have a root, it, 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 um, it proliferates by going on a surface. And the whole approach that is kicked off by Deleuze and Guattari, and earlier still by Leotard and his postmodern condition, is that if you dig down into the ground, you will not find anything. There is nothing to discover. There is only invention, there's only assemblages. So the attack is on uh, being against um, having roots, having, uh, and he calls it a boreal philosophy. And he, in fact, he, he argues that the whole of Western philosophy is a boreal, i.e. a tree with roots that then has branches, and it, and it creates a certain order, a certain logic. So what 
Deleuze and Guattari suggest in the Rhizo uh, chapter, uh, chapter one, introduction, uh, which I was going to put up there so you could actually see it while, while I went through it, uh, but failed. The first thing that he has is this odd uh, musical scale. I don't know how many people are musicians in here, uh, actually, sound, uh, but this is nothing that you could play. This is, this is an odd uh, kind of uh, configuration. And it has a logic, but it's not clear what that logic is. So I need you to take note of the fact that this is what this is about. Now, what he suggests is that one has to get rid of, one has to literally throw it up, throw it out, this obsession with grounding something. The grounding of something happens and is required if you are trying to make the argument that something should be objective, it's not your opinion, it's good art, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then there needs to be a ground, a, something that you can pin it down to. And then from that you have the objective and the subjective. Now I'm not going to go into that unless you need it further explained. We're just going to put that on the table and let it sit for a second. But what he tries to argue is that one has to get a sense of what an assemblage is what a multiplicity is, what a deterritorialization is. And he basically says that he's, well, he doesn't basically say it as overtly as he could have said it. What he's basically doing is attacking zero and one. Now, for those of you that are interested in computing, you know that zero and one are the codes of computing. I don't have to go to computing science to know this, but a zero in the old sense, that is to say prior to the net, meant nothing or go that way or don't do something, it meant no. And the one meant a number, like one in this case, it meant a, a way in which something could be developed. In a postmodern read or in a, let's say, a, an internet grasp of the zero and one, that is not what it means. And that's the first thing you need to get a sense of. The zero is a cohesion. The zero could be called an enframing. We're just going to leave that floating for a moment. I'll come back to that. But the zero acts as something completely different than this one, which, which is not, in fact, the number one. It's a segment. So you have segments and you have planes, P-L-A-N-E, planes. You have a segment and you have planes. And if you take these together, you have what turns out to be the, the basis of robotics, artificial intelligence, and as it will turn out, postmodernism. Now, so the zero and the one, he's going to start playing with terms when you start reading this. The zero stands for what he calls the body without organs. And of course, Zizek and his infinite annoyance, he's another person I have issues with. I have so many issues with so many of them. <laughs> anyway, uh, Zizek will call, one of his latest books was called something like Organs Without Bodies. There's a little bit of a joke uh, against this, which is fair enough. I mean, it's not that brilliant. But, but you need to just get a sense of what's going on here. So you have a body, a consistency, and then you have a segment, a one. And they're, they're not opposite each other. It's not, like, it's not like in dialectics where you have antithesis and thesis, and taken together, they take a hold of the issue. This is like they're oblique to each other. They're at oblique angles, you could almost say. But, but they're also contained. Uh, I was going to say, they're contained with each other, but they're contained not because of some overarching totality. They're contained because there is no outside and there is no inside. There is simply the plane of consistency and the segment. And the plane of consistency, I'm going to delve into just for a moment here, and then we'll get into what this is about. Your work in sound landscapes is a plane of consistency. Your work in colors is playing with this plane of consistency. You need to get a sense of how this actually operates, how this 
the Gray's Anatomy starts playing with planes of consistency. That is to say, there's a way in which they hang together, and you need to figure out what makes them stick. This is the key. Because assemblages don't matter. We have a bunch of things on this table. We could put them in any order. That is not an assemblage. You need to get a sense of how this is operating. An assemblage is not a system in the sense that if we know one, two, three, four, five, six, the next number is going to be seven. And then we go one, two, three, four, five, six, take out the seven, put in the bottle of Coke. So we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, Coke, eight, nine, 10, 11, Coke, and so on and so forth. So you could start changing around the system. Do this because I just know me. <laughs> and I'll be very upset. That was a very expensive book. Okay, so you could have, and so this set of what turns out to be a system can turn into an assemblage when you start messing around with it. You start grabbing things to hand for no other reason than that they're there. So you can say one, two, paper, three, rhizome, five, six, Diet Coke. And you start building, and suddenly, and eventually, you could have, you could drop all those numbers up all together. You don't even have to have any reference to them. Because those, the reference doesn't matter. So, we're gonna, I'm gonna keep throwing this out, just so you keep hearing it. In semiotics, which they're attacking, and Lacan, in this sense, heavy, heavy attacks on the notion of the referent, the notion of what's really behind everything. There is no behind anything. At some point, the, the, the moment drops out, and all you have is the consistency. All you have is the plane. Now, this is the basis of Einsteinian relativity. With Einstein, you have E, to give you the, the obvious one, the, the formula you'll remember, is E equals mc squared. The equals sign holds those two things together. There is no structure underneath that. There's that light again. There is no structure that holds those points together. So when you talk about relativity, relativity does not mean all things that can happen whenever. Relativity means, given this situation, those things that you can play around with so that it remains stuck together. That's what's relative. So this, that I put this in as the number two, so I had one, paper, three, so on and so forth, that's what's relative. But it's not relative because, it's relative on one level because it could have been anything I could have chosen, but I've chosen it within the structure, in this case, that's held together by those equal signs. So what he's getting at, eventually you'll see, or what they're both, Deleuze and Guattari are getting at, is what does it mean to talk about a surface? one. And second of all, the surface is the only thing to talk about because there isn't anything other than a surface. The universe is a surface. There's nothing outside the universe. In Einstein's work, the cosmology keeps expanding. He makes an argument about the, um, the expanding na nature of the universe. Of course, if it kept expanding like this, it would, I don't know, blow up or something. So he has a Einstein adds a feature that he calls the fudge factor because he can't figure out why it doesn't completely expand. Now, I just throw that in because if I asked you to get outside of the universe, there is no way, not because we can't think about how to do it, but because it's not, it's, it doesn't exist to do. And when you start thinking about the universe as something you can't get out of, then things like black holes and wormholes and uh, these, you know, what is the question of black about, takes on a totally different uh, paradigm. And this is what they're trying to get you to think about and more than think about because they're arguing that there is a political and not just uh, aesthetic or philosophical position that's being presented here. This is, they're presenting this as, a, as, as sort of an antidote to fascism. This is where, where they're going with this. And so the criticism against 
postmodernism, and particularly Deleuze and Guattari, and particularly Leotard, is precisely that there's no social agency, that there's nobody, there's nothing that is pushing the, the uh, moment forward. And so they're accused precisely of the thing that they're trying to get away from. They're accused of being very right wing, or they can fall into that category. Okay, so just, just opening this up. So the first thing they argue is that an assemblage is made up of ruptures and multiplicities. So the rupture is the segment, the one. I feel like the matrix here. It's the one. Okay. The multiplicities, this is the plane of consistencies. So when you hear multiplicity, don't think many. When you think multi when you hear multiple, don't think one, don't think more than one. It's not, they're not talking about two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're not talking about numbers in that sense. They're talking about something that has dimensions. A segment is something that would be closer to the number. A rupture could be a number like, like the one, like the two, like the seven, like the million, like the n. But the multiplicity is something very different. It hasn't to do with what they're calling a Western logic. And again, you just keep marking down, you know, I don't get this point. Just, we'll come back to it just so you do get it in the end. Okay, so he makes the argument that assemblages are made up of ruptures and multiplicities. And he says that these ruptures these and multiplicities create the fields around which one can play with things. Again, come back to that. And he calls that structure, not a system, but a machinic, machinic something, a war machine, a love machine, you know, an annoying machine. It's a, it's a machine. It's, it's something that is able to then reproduce as the system, except not, it's not really a system in the one, two, in the numeric sense. It's a system that is, is as such because it creates coherence. It creates some kind of unity, but the unity doesn't have edges. It's like a cloud. The unity is, has a has a way of pulling together, but there's no edges on the outside. So shadows, for example, part of it. There's no edge to a shadow. I mean, there's no exact edge. There's no edge to the edge of the world. If you can still think about it. There's no edge <coughs> to the universe. In fact, they just found another galaxy. Eventually, they got to find life. Just this crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Okay, now, so he says that all books, and in particular, of course, his book, uh, their book, are uh, multiplicities, or what he calls planes of consistency. He rather calls them planes of consistency than text. So we're moving away from a language orientation. So. Under Lacan and under uh, semiotics and uh, certain forms of psychoanalysis, all art, all everything was seen as text. And there was the gaze. You know, you you, you had the you know uh, the feminist gaze. You had the uh, you know the capitalist gaze. It was like this thing that 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 brought you into this realm. And, and they're going, shh, shh. no, there's nothing to. There's no gaze, G A Z E. There's no there's none of this uh, kind of visual encampment. But what he's saying instead is that there's only rhizomes, and these rhizomes operate off of, this thing called the rhizome operates off of six principles. <laughs> That's what I was asking about with, with Mattia. <laughs> okay. The first is this, the first two he links together. It's connection and heterogeneity. So for example, in Holly, at your work, when you have the hand, the lesbian hand, and the genitals being in the fingertips, and it's not just that genitals are on the fingertips, some of the fingers are flat, and some of them are, you know, crazy, you know, and then you know, whatever you have. This would very much be a comment on this kind of scenario, because rhizomatically you pulled these things together and created this, in this case, this hand, which is a plane of consistency. 
that making sense? Yeah. I'll go through each of your works so you can sort of figure out how it works. Okay. So what he says is that principles one and two come together. And he basically makes the argument that everything can be connected to everything. Anything can be connected. In fact, they must be connected. There's, there's any point on any plane could be connected, whereas he says that roots, the tree, the <coughs> radical, plots a point, fixes the order. Here the order is made precisely, not, it's not random at the level of this lay sense of relativity. It's random at this more fixed sense. This is your work, really, and how the, the numbers come up. It doesn't really matter what the numbers are. It doesn't even matter that they come up. So what matters is the that that's connecting these things together. And this is all that matters. It's the whole point of it, which is not to say there's no point, but it's not the point that has to do with well, why is that happening? What are you trying to say? So he says that these connections always provide heterogeneity. That is to say, always provide difference. We'll come back to that word. The third point, he says, the third principle, is the principle of multiplicity. There's no universality, there's only assemblages. There's no measurement as such. Metrics don't count. So this course is quite bad for those of us that are in the higher academic world where we have to bring in metrics. There's no point. I, there are, of course, metrics, but there's no point in the metrics. A multiplicity, he goes further to say, is flat. It has no dimension. I mean, sorry, it has no volume, no uh, shape. And yet, it is a something. Can you think of anything that would fall into <coughs> that category? A file on your computer could easily be this thing. It doesn't have a shape. I mean, it has a shape. You're seeing a shape on your screen, but it doesn't really have a shape. If you dropped your iPod or your, or your computer, 50,000 files would not fall out of that thing. So he's one of the first philosophers to begin to talk about how this thing called the multiplicity creates a placeholder. So the multiplicity creates place, creates location, creates what he's going to call later a nodal point, N-O-D-A-L, nodal point. And you can plot those nodal points. And those nodal points, he says, that's a cartography, a map. And that map is a nomadic map. We're going to come back to this. So he says, there's no universality. There's only these assemblages. When you're thinking about the net, just think about, this is easier to speak about now than it was in the 80s and 90s when this book came out. Um, and then it was translated in 2000 or whatever it was, so it really, it's taken a while to filter over to the uh, English-speaking world. Um, <clears throat> when it came out, the net didn't exist. Well, it existed at ARPA. Does anybody know what ARPA is? What does it stand for? Uh, research. What's that D? A R P no ARPA. Yeah. I can't remember. It. Anyway, was that was that military? Yeah. No, it's a military environment. Do you know what it stands for? Uh, no, I know of it. Does anybody know anybody? My father worked in ARPA. Oh, hello, Dad. <laughs> yes. He, in fact, he invented uh, night vision. You know the thing you have on your, you can see at night. He invented it. Sadly, he invented it for the military. A no pattern. B, kill people. Anyway, but now we're using it for art. Think of the advantages. Um, okay, so at that time, the idea of a net, the idea of a web, was simply you know like 
blah. Nobody could understand. It doesn't make any sense. Nowadays, we can already understand. If I say to you, you drop your computer and all these files are going to fall out, you're not going to think, well, of course it's not going to fall out. Stupid, you know, kind of idea. But then just take it, keep taking it back and think, okay, well, then what does that file do on my computer? What does that music, where is that music placed in the computer? Where is the brain? Where is the memory? Where is it sitting? Not sitting anywhere. It doesn't sit anywhere. If you're gonna, if you open up your computer, you will not find it. And it's true, he says, for the entire civilization, you don't have to just stop at the web. And that the problem has been that looking at dialectics the way it has been doing closes down this scenario. So he says that multiplicities are flat, by which he doesn't mean that they're thin. He means that they don't have normal substances to them, like volume, like weight, like depth. They have these things, but they're created through light and speed. And it's creepy. And you need to get a set. We're just going to keep pounding you on this. So the, yep. John. So you're saying that it is physical. It's bad height and speed. Okay. Yeah, it's physical. But physical is kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, it's not a concept. It's an oh, yeah, it's not a concept. We're, we're, yeah. Well, parenthesis, the kind of philosophy that we're doing here is physical, okay? Is immersive. Yeah. Or merciless, as I like this. Other <laughs> So it's not a concept that's being applied. No, no, it's a good point you're raising. Very smart. OK, so this flat thing, they're struggling for ways to talk about it, <clears throat> is the way I try to you know, rationalize why it sounds so stupid sometimes. But if you read the very early Deleuze and Guattari, you might use like a knife <coughs> it because they're, they're, they're so, it's like, it, Difference in Repetition was his PhD thesis, which is very depressing because it's like, you know, one of these breakthrough books. But it's almost impossible to read. It really is. Uh, later on, they get better. By the time he's running A Thousand Plateaus, it's like, oh, yeah, walk in the park. Makes sense. OK, but these are very, you know, complicated conversations, but I'm going to try and put them to you. So the third principle of multiplicity is that the thing called multiplicity is a substance. It's just not a substance like, you know, Coca-Cola. Or maybe to put it slightly differently, it is a substance like Coca-Cola. It's just that this Coca-Cola has no weight, has nothing to it. And yet it creates place. And it's not an essence either. It's not like inside, you know, myself, like with the Hegelian moment, the tree had an essence called treeness or humanness or animalness, there's something inside, you know, this thing that made you who you are. Nothing makes you who you are. You don't even make you who you are. What creates the who you are is this relationship between connection and multiplicity, between the zero and the one. The zero, again, not being the number zero, as in nothing, although that in itself is kind of an interesting problem. I'll skip that for a second. You know, there are a lot of civilizations that don't have zero or didn't have zero. And what is zero when you really think about it? Is zero the middle between one, two, three, four, five and negative one, two, three, four, five? Is the zero a placeholder? Or is the zero an imaginary number? Or is the zero, I don't know, should there not be a zero? Should there just be one, two, three, four, five, negative one, two, three, four, five? What's the zero business? So Zero, if you go look it up on Google or wherever, you'll find that it, it became a, um, a scary symbol, zero. Uh, in uh, Buddhism, zero, uh, uh, there, there are these things called bees, the bee, and you stare at, this, at the center to contemplate, to meditate, to empty your thought. Because zero is both infinite and nothing at the same time. And I don't know about you, but I find that creepy, that it can be both everything and nothing. It is both speed and static. It's the, 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 and this is why the only way they talk about it in the rhizome is as a plane, plane
plane of consistency, which doesn't mean it's, it's sedentary. It just means it's this plane. Okay, I hope I'm getting myself there. So when you think of multiplicity, do not think versus one, like one, two, three, four, five, like two, three, four, four, five, that's multiple, and one, singular, no. A multiplicity, okay, ready, is a singularity. <sighs> Write it down because you're gonna learn what was language here. It's a plane of consistency. It has no depth, it has no plural in the in the sense of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, those kind of plurals. <coughs> it's multiple because it's heterogeneic. Okay. Point number four. He calls it the principle of A signifying, A dash signifying. Or in fact actually it doesn't put a dash in there, I'm putting it in there so you can hear it. A signifying, so A S I G N I F Y I N G. A signifying. Now, to signify means what? Does anybody know what to signify means? To signify. Yeah. If you signify something, it's, yeah, exactly. And he's saying that there is nothing being represented here. It's also an attack, a secret attack, or not so secret attack on semiotics. Again, sign, signifier. Signified. Anybody ever study semiotics? Okay, good. So, I, uh, so just empty your mind of semiotics. Just get rid of it. I don't know if that's attacking anybody in the, in the institution here, but anyway, just kidding. Okay, no, get rid of it. Uh, semiotics, dialectics, the notion of the gaze, the notion of the symbolic, real, and imaginary. They're just getting rid of. And they're saying, you want to talk about what's actually going on? Then you have to get a sense of how the zero and one operate together as a rhizomatic expression. The world is based on randomness, which doesn't mean that it's arbitrary in the sense that anything happens. As you may have a sense, this starts under playing stuff on complexity theory, on chaos, mosis. I'll come back to that. So the principle, number four, is the principle of what he calls a signifying rupture. So the first one, or the one just before, principle number three, was on multiplicity. That's like the zero. And principle number four is on a signifying ruptures, which is one. of the two things? One. The one. Very good. Yes! The segment. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. You never knew that you'd know you'd love maths. I know, it's scary, isn't it? Okay. Maths is just a language, you know, it's just like anything else. If you don't know the codes, you it doesn't mean anything. So the one and the zero. So he says the next thing you must understand is this principle of A signifying ruptures, that it will create what he calls deterritorializing. Deterritorializing. It means that the nomadic, the wandering, is a segment that, that creates the possibility for something to happen. Now, not because you're wandering around, you might have, you know, a giant piece of shit fall on your head and there, you know, like a bird, you know, finds you. It's not a happening at that level. It's not an event. It's not because you're wandering around going, wow, that's interesting, boof, something happens to you. <laughs> it's rather that the wandering is the rupture. The wandering is the segment. The wandering is the one. God, I, who is that person that always said that, looking for the one? Was it, his name was it Nemo. What was the guy's name? No, what was that guy's name in the, oh, in the Matrix? I can't think of it. Neo. Neo. 
As if. Nemo, Neo. Okay. I mean, really. Here they had such a great script, but you know the Hollywood had to get in there and go, wait a second, this is not going to work. He's got to look for dad. You know, otherwise, nobody's going to buy it. Comment on Hollywood. Anyway, still I love Hollywood. Okay, so let's get it very clear here. The principle of A signifying ruptures. It may shatter, but if it shatters your plane of consistency, it doesn't matter. In what well, I mean, you might have a nervous breakdown, you might completely freak out, so on some <laughs> level it will matter. But in fact, it'll start up again. Because there is no, I mean, I feel like a song coming in. There's no beginning and there's no end. It's just the, it's just the kind of piece that's being put out, pulled out from this. So the first principle is that there is connection, and, and the second is that there's heterogeneity. The third principle is the principle of multiplicity, which is the zero which is the plane. The fourth principle is the principle of A signifying rupture is the one. You take the multiplicity and you take the rupture and you have what they call the event. The event is not, <coughs> like I said, a bird coming out of your head. The event is something that forces the change of direction so radically and in such a way that you have no idea where you're going, but it doesn't matter because you're just going. And they call it a, 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 a certain flight. I'll get back to that in a second. And he uses the example, which I find deeply annoying, of the wasp and the orchid. So there's this orchid sitting there. And the wasp comes along and pollinates and then goes off to another orchid somewhere else and pollinates and goes off somewhere else and pollinates. And that is this moment. There's no logic except for the fact that the wasp wants to have this nectar. And it gets on the little legs and goes somewhere else. I think it's a kind of crummy argument, but it, it's just trying to visualize, I guess. Principle five is that the basis of postmodern existence is a map. It's understanding that life is a, is a cartography, cartography, the graphic of the map. C A R T O G R A T H Y, cartography. Now, this cartography. <coughs> isn't like you know where you're going. This cartography is very similar to the Wittgensteinian principle of certainty. So for those of you who want to take a further look, go look at Wittgenstein's On Certainty. And you'll see that there he has, actually it might have been in Remarks on Mathematics. Anyway, he says, you can't say to somebody, go to that church tower. Um, which is five miles off, and make a right if they can't see the church tower. If you don't know where you're going, if I tell you, well, go to that tower, it, it's not going to be helpful because <coughs> it's not about finding the destination. The it's a very different form of a map. It's a map that says there's a journey. It's a map that has nodal points, but it's not a map that gives you a direction. You are the direction. You are the spore, as it were. You're sporing. So the map keeps changing. And he says that the change is based on what he calls decalicomania. decalicomania. Calicomania, D-E, I can never, this is another word. In fact, I, I struck it out several times while I was writing it for tonight because I can never even spell it right. Okay, D-E-C, decalcomania, decalcomania. Does anybody have an idea what that is before I tell you what it is? What's mania, by the way? Obsession. Yes. 
How does it mean? Yes, it means, well, it means to trace something that in this case doesn't exist. So irritating how they talk like this. You too will talk like this when you become more of a philosopher. He's attacking Derrida and other people who talk about this thing called the trace, that the, the society leaves a trace. He's actually also attacking anthropologists, the trace. He say, it's not about a trace. OK, that's not to say there are no such things as traces. But if you want to understand the map, the cartography, tracing is not, the, is not what's going to do it. It's the erasure of the tracing and how that gets disrupted. It's the way in which um, It's the way in which the trace is um, is cons how can I put this? I'm going to try and put it slightly differently. A tattoo could be considered um, a decalcomania, in the sense that anybody have a tattoo? You really know what a tattoo? You know you know how to get a tattoo? You know what happens when you get a tattoo? You get this thing. They put it on your arm or wherever you're getting your tattoo. It's a they trace something. They put it on your forehead. They rip it off and they do their little thing. This kind of thing. The decalcomania isn't that the tattoo is, you know, what's left of the trace. It's that the fact that there's a relationship between where that tattoo got placed on the map, in which case is your head your body, and the fact that you chose arbitrarily or otherwise the tattoo. Most of you get tattooed, or most of all of us get tattooed in a variety of circumstances. Mm. Yes. <laughs> uh, often, not always uh, sober. If it's uh, a certain kind of pen and ink, it's often prison. Stuff like that. Do you, when you got your tattoo? The one of them, yeah. I was you were in prison. No, no, no. No. Tipsy. What? You're tipsy. <laughs> <laughs> Softly <cold. laughs> Yes. Oh, it's fun, though. <laughs> so, but the idea here is that when you think about tracing, all of you have done tracing at some mm. point. When you think about tracing something, it's, that's not what's telling you anything. What tells you something is how the trace becomes tattooed. It's how the trace begins to work on the surface. Style. It can become a style, but that's the jump. You jumped just then. It's much slower yet. If you think of the skin as this plane of consistency, then the trace is the segment. <laughs> Except it's not a trace. Well, I mean, you can be tracing something, but it creates its rupture. So the decalcomania is the let's say, the aesthetic grasp of the segment. Did you get that? So you have a segment, you have zero and one, back to the beginning. Back to when you were children, you didn't know about zero and one, that was at the beginning of the hour. Now you're used to it. Okay, now you know the one is the segment. But who cares, how does it become Aesthetic. By aesthetic, I don't necessarily mean beautiful. I mean, how does it work so that it will work as a cohering? How does that actually manifest itself? And he's saying, in order to manifest itself in the way that will cohere, like the E equals MC squared coherence, you've got to be alert to the fact that it's in relationship to a map, a cartography. In any case, he makes the argument that there's no deep structure. There is, again, it's just the surface. It's just always a surface. So he says that the problem is, is that history is always written from the point of view of the radical. I mean, R-A-D-I-C-L-E, -E, not the militant, sadly. It's always written on, from the point of view of the, the radical, the root, getting to the root of the issue. When in fact, he says, Reality is actually forged 
in the relation between cartography and decalcomania. And this is what creates uh, <coughs> um, meaning. So what have you heard so far? Because I'm going to now go into the thing. Yes? So if you have a heteronormative society, yes. the, and if you start to look at the idea of queer and where that comes in, the erasure of the trace of queer because of the heteronormative society is it, disturbed. But the whole finding the rupture, the A-signifying, is the research looking for that. Well, there's no tracing. Okay. So, for example, a different way to put that, and there's different strategies in gay politics, is, for example, everybody's wearing more or less the same outfit, pretty much. We're all wearing the same outfit. I mean, nobody's here in a tutu. No one's here in some sort of, like, sort of, I don't know, um, elephant outfit or something like that. I mean, you would think I was doing something very strange if I came in dressed in scuba gear. So like we're all dressed as a uniform. You, you get it. You get when I come in. Now, to rupture something, one of the strategies of almost every movement, whatever that is, is to recognize that there is this system and then to put the bottle of Coke and take out the one thing. So a lot of people started wearing one earring, um, started uh, putting handkerchiefs in a pocket, different colors. Unfortunately for people like myself, they never keep up with which color meant what and which side meant whatever. It was always a bit complicated, but these little tiny things would matter, created matter. They created a space, they created a place. And so it starts, it's, it is a style, but the style comes afterwards because it's in a relationship. So in short, it might start out as against something. That would be the, let's say, the radical. But in fact, the queer side of it was not against anything. I mean, it obviously was against repression. But it's not set up, the identity isn't set up against. It's set up for something, going in a different direction. So, but it, the way he's saying that kind of thing gets established, gets established in a very, um, specific kind of way. Like, for example, I don't know how many people, you know, to say, look around, have um, rings on their thumbs. For a very long time, a ring on the thumb at a, you know, meant that you were into fist fucking. Who knew? Well, a certain group of people knew, and you could always tell that that group knew because you know that there was a knowledge of this going on, and so there was a whole kind of thing going on. Now, when that sort of became very picked up, very trendy, let's say, very much of a style. It wasn't like the entire society was now suddenly engaged in very interesting sexual practices. It was rather that they just thought it looked okay. Took it. So it then started being divested of any, it, it just flattened out. It didn't have any meaning. It didn't have no meaning. It didn't really have any meaning either. Same with the one earring or the two earrings or whatever. I mean, when I, I can tell you that when I was, um, when I was a child, I had really long hair, believe it or not, uh, and I had decided, yes, I'm going to take a stand, a, a gay stand, and I'm going to get my ear pierced. Well, it turns out, in the U.S. anyway, if you're gay, you got your ear pierced on the left side. No, if you, in, in, in the U.K., you got your ear pierced on the left side. So, of course, I made a mistake and got it pierced on the right side. But my mother, bless her, um, who has since passed away, uh, she, when I came to see her, having not seen her for like six or seven months, I mean, quite, quite a stretch actually for this time, maybe it was even eight, eight or nine months, I came in surprising them, the kind of long hair, could hardly see anything, could certainly not see ears, and from 400 paces away, saw that I had one earring, shouted out, oh my God, you're a lesbian. And she was the only person in the world who thought that an earring on the right side meant that you were gay. I thought, how did that happen to me? <laughs> this is my life, you know. I put it on the wrong side so nobody else knows, you know, not the people who ought to be caring about this issue, but my mother <laughs> knows. Now, I give you that example because these little markers 
very quiet. They're like little pinpricks on the skin, on the plane of consistency. But remembering that the plane of consistency is a multiplicity. What's consistent is not that it's opaque. It's not like batter. It's consistent in the sense that it creates a plane. That's what's consistent about it. So the tracings become nodal points on this, just like, that's why the mapping is so important. Because on the one hand, you have a plane. On the other hand, you have a segment, as I was saying before. But then you start having this map thing. And the map thing starts as ruptures and ends up as planes. And that's also interesting. So you have this, they're not, they're not normal, these concepts. They keep shifting around. So in Hegelian logic, you have thesis, antithesis. And the thesis is not an antithesis. A thesis is a thesis, and antithesis is, unless you get sublated and 67,000 other things happen. It becomes a synthesis, comes back around, forms the ground. But here, you have planes of consistency which could rise up and sort of be a nodal point. And that's where this gets tricky, but it's also where it gets, um, well, interesting. Because you're going to start finding in your own work that if your work is dealing at this level of the surface, well, the argument here is that all work is dealing at the level of the surface. All philosophers claim that their work is their work. So see, see what, of this what you can hear, what you can hear for tonight. So I want to just go over just a couple things now looking at the text so you know what, if that's OK. We're a bit tight for time, but is that OK? Are you all right with us? Another 20, 30 minutes, is that OK? OK. So for those of you that actually have the Y zone, uh, one person, <laughs> if you turn to page um, four, I just want to point to, what's that? I think it's, is it page four? It should be. Yeah. Um, yeah. It should be. It's those lines. These lines produce phenomena. That should be that. See? That should say. Yours doesn't say that. These lines produce phenomena. That one. Is that how It's a page. Oh, it's it's a page. <laughs> okay. We're all on more or less kind of the same page. I think you're on page five. <laughs> It should start, these lines produce phenomena of relative slowness and viscosity. Okay. What's that? Yeah, a book has, well, okay, so the very first paragraph on, on introduction to Rhizome, okay, yeah. then the next paragraph, then so it's in the middle of the second paragraph, basically. Okay. So, in fact, John, seeing that's in front of you, can you read um, down to a book itself is a little machine? So if you can read, and, and, and read as though your life depended on it. There's a gun to your head. Okay. <laughs> so all this, lines and measurable speeds. Try that. Look at all things that are lined up. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Still close this thing. Let's read that one. Can you find it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All this. So here, this is the first thing he's talking about. Okay. Is the way that ruptures and planes of consistency get established. And I want you to hear this, now that I'm giving you this kind of general background. Go for it. Update. All this, lines and measurable speeds, constitutes an assemblage. Okay, just say it one more time, this time with feeling. <laughs> <laughs> All this, lines and measurable speeds, constitutes an assemblage. A book is an assemblage of this kind, and as such is an attribute too uh, unattributable. It is a multiplicity that we don't know yet at the mul multiple entail what yet 
after multiple entails when it is no longer attributed, that is, after it has been elevated to the status of a substantive. Just ignore that sentence. Ignore that substantive thing. What, what does that mean? Does anybody, can anybody figure out what that means? It is a multiplicity, but we don't know yet what the multiple entails when it is no longer attributed. What does that sentence mean? Because it sounds like gobbledygook. Is it about reading? What's that? Is it about reading? Nope. About language. It is about language. Who said that? Oh, Jude. Yeah. Something we can't control? Not yet. Okay. It is a multiplicity, but we don't know yet what the multiple entails when it is no longer attributed. That is, after it has been elevated to the status, to the status of a substantive. Is it sort of to do with way we string words together and sentences. It we don't know until we read them what they're going to be. Yeah, well, what is a substantive? I'm just taking a wild guessing that no one actually knows what it is. It's a name. It's, it's a noun, really. It's, it's a noun. So yeah, yeah, name, noun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it means that one, <coughs> once you start putting clothes on this this file that's floating around in your computer, once you start seeing it as something that has weight and depth and is a thing, once you see it as a thing, then the multiplicity evaporates. Once you've made it into this thing, then you don't have the multiplicity he's talking about. That's what I'm trying to get you to see, which is not to say it's not physical. It's changing the ground. It's changing the ground. Yes, can you can you elaborate on that? That's a very good point. Um, it just I don't know. Well, in my thoughts, I was thinking because it's almost it's moving it of something we're very familiar with. So it's it's lifting it away and gives it a different non ground as such. Exactly right. You want to repeat yeah. that to the people? <laughs> <laughs> you sure? It, uh, Stuart, well, it's basically changing the level system, the levels of understanding in some ways. Okay. So you're absolutely right about this ground issue. Jakob, did you have something you want to add to that? Uh, no. No, that was perfect. Get, trying to get it. <laughs> yes, I loved it. <laughs> trying to imagine it. <laughs> okay. It is a multiplicity. We, but we don't yet know what the multiple entails when it is no longer attributed. So we don't really know yet what we mean by this thing multiple. Because normally when we think of multiple, we think of these noun type things. We think of, you know, lots of things on the table. Those are multiples. But he's saying, well, don't, don't do that. Don't go there. Continue. One side of a machinic assemblage faces the strata, which doubtless makes it a kind of organism, or signing totality, or determination attributable to a subject. It, is also, it also has a side facing a body without organs, which is continually dismantling the organism, causing a signifying particle or pure intensities to pass or circulate and attributing to itself subjects that it leaves with nothing more than the name as a trace of an intensity. Now, I see your paintings like that. I see that that's what you're trying to do with your paintings. So we're going to go back to that. Um, okay. Hannah, you want to read that out loud again? Is that okay? Okay. Anybody want to read it, Dan? Dean? But with with her. One side of the machine. Yeah, that one. One side of the machine assemblage faces the strata. Okay, stop. What does that mean? One side of the machine assemblage faces the strata. I mean, is he talking about like you know? It's like what the hell. <laughs> One side of the machinic assemblage faces the strata. What's a machinic assemblage? This is tough stuff. Let's go back to your ground. The zero and the one. The zero and the one, yes. Okay, and which one? One side of the machinic assemblage faces the strata. Which side is that? Yes. How'd you get there? Um, this, uh, I suppose the strata, and, and you saying it's, it's like holding yes. things together. Good. Okay, we're getting there. I mean, Greg, if you thought about this in terms of your journey to Japan, the map. 
to Japan includes getting on the plane, figuring out what you're bringing, learning about paper. That's your cartography. It's not, quote, just the landscape itself, although that's also part of it. So he's saying one side of the machinic assemblage faces the ruptures you're going to deal with. which doubtless makes it a kind of organism or signifying totality or determination attributable to a subject. It also has a side facing a body without organs, which is continually dismantling the organism, causing A signifying particles or pure intensities to pass or circulate, and attributing to itself subjects that, lead, that it leaves with nothing more than a name as the trace of an intensity. Okay. Anybody want to translate that? See, now this is what I think your work does, John, when you're doing your little paintings on film. The, what it ends up, it also has a side facing a body without organs. It also has a side facing a plane of consistency. It also has a side that creates a surface which is continually dismantling the organism, causing a signifying particles, causing things that don't make sense. They work, but they don't make sense. It's, a, it's not like they don't make any, it's not like they don't work at all, but that they, they work in a different way. So the sense that is made is not common sense. It's some other kind of sense. So, which is continually dismantling the organism, causing asignifying particles or pure intensities to pass or circulate energies and attributing to itself subjects that leave it with nothing more than a name as the trace of an intensity. So in those two sentences lies the whole of the Thousand Plateaus. And he spends the rest of the book explaining those two signs. Because he's basically saying a multiplicity, but we don't really know what that means because people think a multiplicity means all this kind of stuff. Multiplicity has to do with these assemblages, but these assemblages are more like uh, things that that have some kind of a systematic base, except there is no base, there is no ground. So if you're going to create a shadow of something that has no ground, what would that look like? If there's, there's no ground, the absence of light, it? it is the absence of light, Sarah. <laughs> it is the absence of light, but could it be? It, let's say that the cartography and the segments that are creating that they don't have to be grounded. They don't have to be grounded in reason. They have to be coherent. That coherent. What, the, the question would be, what's the shadow of that coherence? Can you think of what that would be for you, Greg? You were dealing with the cartography of the Japanese moment. The shadow of that, the trace of that, is what for you? The trace of having been in Japan, you spoke about earlier. The effect. Uh, paper. Your your experience of paper and what you're doing with paper is the shadow, is the trace of that map. But isn't that evidence? No, because the evidence, I'm glad you raised it, the evidence is trying to put it in terms of an order, of a making sense. This is a more of a David Byrne moment. Stop making sense. It's not, he's, they're trying, he's trying to say, What's the, your shadow of how this works? What's the, what's the way in which one are, can articulate this relationship between assemblages, this cartography? Well, you were right to say, well, you know, the thing that's come out of it that keeps haunting you is this paper. And that, that's very important, how that works. And actually, there's a whole series of work about this on hauntology. And the hauntologies are about this relationship of how 
assemblages to, to create this other side. Okay, just a little bit longer, and then you're going to be. Uh, can you, um, John, can you go back to um, a book itself is a little machine? Oops. <laughs> A book itself is a little machine. It's a little bit Is that the other It's a little, it's, it's, it's a little further down the page. Oh. Okay, Stuart, why don't you read that? How far do you want me to get out to? Just go down to uh, the oh, end right. of the paragraph. Did you find it? Mm. Okay, why don't you read that? Okay, a, book it, a book itself is a little machine. What is the relation, also measurable, of this literary machine to a war machine? love machine, revolutionary machine, etc., and an abstract machine that sweeps them along. We have been criticised for overquoting literary authors, but when one writes, the only question is what, which other machine the literary machine can be plugged into, must be plugged into in order to work. Kleist and the mad war machine, Kafka and the most extraordinary bu bureaucratic machine. What if one became animal or plant through literature? Through literature, which certainly does not mean literally, it is not first through the voice that one becomes animal. Is it not the first? First through the voice that one becomes animal. Literature is an assemblage. It has nothing to do with ideology. There is no ideology and never has been. All we talk about are multiplicities, lines, strata and segmenta segmentarities, lines of flight and intensities, machinic assemblages and their various types, bodies without organ and their construction and selection the plane of consistency, and in each case, the units of measure. I don't understand that. Okay, stop, stop, stop. So, Jacob, you want to try and give it a go? With mm. that, that paragraph now? All we talk about are multiplicities, lines, stratas, and segmentarities, lines of flight, and intensities. <clears throat> so they talk about the surface, right? What yeah. creates the surface? So all those elements, yes. assembled, the one, the zero, it yes. all creates surface for you to play with. For you to play with, that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> like to walk on, is that the... To, to walk on, to play with, and to also learn how to spore okay. the line of flight. Your work, yeah. for example, it, you know, the fact that you're doing it in film or photography or your little books that you had, the framings and so on, they're basically the same thing. It doesn't really matter on one level that you did photography or is it, because what you're playing with is something that exceeds those technologies. Something there. Yeah, and it's allowing you to float like a float like a butterfly, sting <laughs> like a bee. <laughs> this is I, we're, we're just cracking the surface of this. Um, he gets he goes further, and then we'll just worry about the time. A first type of book is the root book. The tree is already the image of the world, or the root, the image of the world tree. This is the classical book, as noble, signifying, and subjective, organic interiority. So he's, he, he, he's saying, but if you start thinking, let's say, from the perspective, as it were, of the web, I'm just going to use the web because one's used to this a little bit more, then you can see that this is clunky. It's, 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 it's not going to, uh, not this, it, the dialectics, the, the, the root scenario, the meaning behind everything, it doesn't apply. Don't look, don't try to discover yourself, he's saying, invent yourself. There is no self to discover. This is what they're getting at. There is no gay to discover, no woman to discover, no, it was not to say there's no female, gay, male, Jew, Muslim, whatever the stories are. He's saying that it's not about discovery. It's about how things have been assembled that create sticking points. And those assemblages are sometimes so raw and so hard that it's tough to unassemble them. And he says further, we haven't gotten there and we won't get there tonight, that there is the molecular machine. He said basically that fascism operates by slowly getting into different pockets. 
so that things just very quietly turn deep and deep. And they keep turning so that it massifies. It creates a plane of consistency that is homogeneic as opposed to heterogeneic. Okay, I'm going to just ask you to. I think that I think we've probably covered enough for tonight. I don't know how are you guys doing. Exhausted, dead, fine. Happening. Any questions so far? I mean, it, it's a t it seems like it's really easy to read, but then we just keep <coughs> remembering. If you take anything else away from tonight's lecture or tonight's seminar, zero and one does not mean nothing and something. It means planes of consistency and segments. Can a segment be plane of consistency and then create another segment? No. Um, yeah, I think it could, if, by, if what you mean by that... Can segment be big enough to create it? Like, or small enough. Yeah, small yeah. enough like. Well, because a segment is a rupture. Mm. So it disturbs the plane of consistency. So it, yeah. it disturbs the plane of consistency. So I don't see why a plane of consistency couldn't rupture something else. Mm. So I think that that's the case. But just for the time being, this is the problem having smart people in the room, keep thinking ahead. Just try and stay here. OK, don't think further ahead yet. Just stay with the, stay here. Just, just think, 0, 1 is not on, off. 0 is, is an infinite. A uh, moment that can be captured as a slice, and it has no edge. It simply has a consistency, like the galaxy, which I think is really creepy. It's kind of like Escher drawing. You know, you never get outside of the the universe. I, I still find that a very creepy concept. In fact, a very creepy reality. That what's outside the galaxy? The galaxy. What's outside that galaxy? The galaxy. It's like Russian dolls, except reversed. Just there is no outside. So if there's really no outside to reality, then where does that leave change, certainty, art, objectivity? One requires limits in order to think. And they're saying, no, you don't. Actually, you can think very differently. You can think queer. That's not a limit if it's being done in this way. You can think you know, um, in, in an anti-signifying way. That'll create this cartography. That'll create this direction. And it, it will disrupt an order. And so it is dangerous. And so you must understand that what you're reading here that seems very banal and very academic, very kind of, you know, uh, is actually very threatening. I feel very good that we're in a very safe environment and broadcasting to the web. But it's, it's, it is very disruptive to refuse the us-them game politically. But it's even more disruptive, not just to refuse it, but to realize that it isn't an us-them game. And to see how things can actually work. As soon as people started, Grey's Anatomy is a very good example, actually. As soon as people started realizing that the smallest particle was not an atom, but was viral, it's the difference between understanding how you can't dig down to the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest thing, which already was a breakthrough from thinking that the world was made up of dragons and you know monsters. But, but when one started realizing, when medicine started realizing, started as, a, as a field, started beginning to see, wait a second, it's not that you have to dig down. You have to completely think differently about how landscapes of illness happen. That's when people started cracking AIDS and cancer, because it doesn't operate as all that there is and all that there's not is a totality. It operates as zero planes of infinite, infinity 
in segments. And it completely rewrites, well, medical illustration in your case, <laughs> dealing with Grey's Anatomy. But as it turns out, it rewrites everything else too. And did you know that Einstein was, um, he came up with the theory of relativity when he was working as a, as like a shop assistant or something yeah. pathetic like that. It's fantastic. And he brought it to people saying, hey, look at my theory. And he was like, that's ridiculous. Okay. Um, I just mentioned that because what you're working on right now, all of you are working on these kind of similar questions. Uh, it's wild stuff. And you need to understand a little bit more how come it's wild so that you can not tame it, but you can guide your practice with it. So, okay, tomorrow, what's going to happen? Try and read this again, and again, and again, and again. And I say, read it to the mirror. Read it as though you're applying, you're trying for an Academy Award or something. Um, the um, the thing is that Stan's Cafe tomorrow at five o'clock to seven, they're going to try and you know get you guys to sign up to give your work uh, to be in a, a big exhibition, which I think just run away from. Don't do it. <laughs> of course you should do it. It's supposed to be a fantastic venue. Um, okay, so I see you tomorrow, but we'll do the next lecture next week. Thanks for the Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>